Adi Fudetta's story isn't as bad as a lot of you may think it is. Sure, it can definitely be a bit cliche at times, but the pacing of Season 1 made it seem a lot worse than it actually is. Luckily for us, Season 2 has adopted a much more manageable pace, one that probably won't give you whiplash with how fast it's going. So, rather than talk about the minor, less important details from there, I think a better approach would be to talk about the cut content from here. The massive gaps in the story that really helped to develop both the world and its characters. Now, it's definitely impossible to cover it all, but I do think I'll be able to get through the most important stuff. Starting with the entirety of Shia's surprisingly tragic backstory, as well as Hajime's evolution into this cold-blooded killer. Let's get started. As we learned back in Episode 6, Shia was the daughter of the Halia tribe's chieftain, a small colony of rabbit men who lived deep in the Haltana woods. These woods were part of Tortoise's Sea of Trees, and within that Sea of Trees there existed the Beastmen country of Verbergen. But it was out of all the Beastmen that lived in this country that the Rabbitmen were by far the weakest. The only things they were good at were hearing and hiding, and what many of them knew them for were their exceptional cuteness. So, because these Rabbitmen had such an alluring appearance, that made them quite the coveted item among slave traders. It was only natural for many collectors in the Eastern Holsher Empire to pay good money for them. Luckily, that wasn't something Shia's tribe had to worry about because the remote village kept them far away from any trouble. You see, rather than have to worry about anyone hunting them, instead these few hundred rabbit men were able to focus on taking care of their own. To them, family was the most important. So, when the anomaly of Shia was born into their tribe, rather than cast her out like how all the other races would have, these rabbit men decided to keep her a secret. Her light blue hair and ability to control mana was something that the leaders of Verbergen would never allow. Had they found out about her existence, then there was no doubt that they'd try to execute her. That's just how much the Beastmen hated the monsters. Any sort of trait that went to indicate you were related to them would instantly place you as public enemy number one. So, for 16 years, Shia's existence was kept a secret. Then, it wasn't until her identity was revealed by an outsider that the Rabbitmen would start to become targeted by the other tribes, resulting in them having no choice but to flee the forest. Of course, they could have just given up Shia to be executed, but because the rabbit men valued family over everything else, they decided the best course of action was to leave together. Their first idea was to create a new settlement up in the mountains, but it was while on their way there that their tribe was spotted by the Empire. Imperial soldiers who unfortunately just so happened to be there. Given that there was enough of them to form a battalion, the Halia's only option was to head back south now. So, in addition to the whole of Verbergen looking for Shia, a battalion-sized army of knights was now chasing them as well. Some of the men did try to stay back and fight, but their inherently weak nature resulted in over half being captured. It had left the Halia with no other option but to run into the Racing Gorge. The reason they had chosen here was because the Gorge was a monster-infested place that nullified basic magic. It was a highly dangerous location that the rabbit men hoped the soldiers would be too afraid to chase them into. And while they were correct in making that assumption, unfortunately the gorge's limited exits meant that they couldn't escape either. You see, because the soldiers decided to camp by the exits, the Halia had effectively trapped themselves in the racing gorge, making them easy targets for all the monsters prowling within it. Then, by the time the Halia decided it was better to be captured than eaten alive, the monsters had already chased them beyond the point of return. Even if the rabbit men did want to leave, all they could do now was run around and stall their inevitable death. 20 of the remaining 60 had already been killed that way. So, with very little hope remaining, she was sent on her own to find the people of her visions, bringing us to the point in which she finally meets Hajime. Now, while the anime did portray Hajime as highly apathetic here, there was actually a moment in which he started to feel for her. It was after she had told him the specifics of her power that Hajime had begun to understand a bit of what she was going through. The fact she could see the future yet not be able to change it was a struggle against fate similar to his own. Yes, the future was something that could always be changed, but there were certain key events that could never be changed no matter how hard she tried. So, despite having likely foreseen the demise of her entire family, Shio was here taking this abuse trying to save what was left of it. This was her doing all she could to reach a future that ensured her tribe's survival. And that was the aspect of her plea that Hajime could sympathize with. As for Shia herself, well, as a girl whose innate talents made her different from everyone else, there was a certain happiness that came from knowing Hajime and Yue were just like her. Yes, her family did shower her with as much love as she could hope for, but there was no changing the fact that she was inherently different. 
These monster-like traits which led to her seclusion was a major aspect of her life that no one else could relate to. So, as the years went by, it's only natural that this inability to truly connect with anyone would eventually lead to an immense feeling of loneliness. Luckily for her, Hashime and Yue would become the very people she'd need to overcome that loneliness, a recurring element of her character that defines her growth throughout the story. It's also because they're anomalies just like her that Shia is able to put a lot more trust in them than she probably should have. In any case, it's after Hajime saves the Halia and guides them out to the gorge that Shia proposes quite the interesting question. If they were to come across Imperial soldiers, then would Hajime be capable of fighting them? Remember, this was before we knew Hajime would kill whoever was his enemy. So, for Shia to propose this question right now, well, the answer would pretty much set the tone for all of Hajime's future conflicts. It was a way of showing us just how much he'd changed due to his time in the labyrinth. As we already know though, Hajime was totally fine killing whoever. It didn't matter if they were the Empire, Humanity, or God himself. If they were someone who was going to stand against him, then the only thing that awaited them was death. So, sure enough, when the group had finally confronted the Imperial soldiers waiting them out, that's exactly what they got for declaring themselves Hajime's enemy. Of course, the 30 plus soldiers didn't think much of Hajime's presence, but it was after they said some pretty vile stuff that Hajime made sure to make them regret it. In only a matter of seconds, Hajime had killed almost all of them. A series of gunshots followed by a single frag grenade was more than enough to leave only one. The rest were either fatally maimed or decapitated by gunshot. As for the one soldier that was left, well, after disclosing what had happened to the previously captured rabbit men, he too met the same fate as his comrades. It was a grim display that the Halia certainly weren't accustomed to seeing. That's not to say they weren't grateful towards the person who had just saved them, but they also couldn't help but be afraid of him. His methods were just a tad bit too brutal for them. Now, one of the main reasons he decided to fight these soldiers by himself was because of the opportunity they'd given him to test his weapons. I mean, sure, he could have just taken out his railgun and slaughtered everyone even quicker, but that would definitely lead to innocent casualties in a more public situation. Just because he no longer had any reservations about killing didn't mean he had any desire to kill people indiscriminately. So, by testing Donner here, Hashime was making sure its firepower was enough for what he needed. And that's one of the more important aspects of his character that needs to be highlighted here. What bugged Hashime the most out of all of this though wasn't the fact that he'd just killed people, but instead the fact that he couldn't care less about it. He was shocked by how easily he'd been able to do it. He wasn't sure before if he'd have any qualms about the act itself, but now he was certain that it didn't bother him in the slightest. It was clear that his philosophy towards his enemies had fully sunk in now. But anyway, once the group had reached the forest, it was only a matter of time until they were confronted by the Tiger Men. A squad of warriors tasked with patrolling the forest, currently led by the captain of Verbergen's second guard squad. Because their job was to protect the forest, it was only natural for them to deem both Hajime and Shia an enemy. Then, because the Halia were the ones that brought them here, they too were considered traitors worthy of being executed. Before the Tiger Men could charge to do anything though, Hashime quickly intervened with a single shot from Donner. He explained the situation and why they were there, then proceeded to warn them of what would happen if they didn't listen to him, all of which was of course layered together with his intimidate skill. So, after Hashime had given his warning, the captain was well aware of just how grave the situation was. One wrong move and he knew for sure him and his companions would be met with death. That said, his position as captain couldn't allow Hajime to proceed into the forest either. Even though Hajime did say he was only searching for the labyrinth, to let someone as strong as him go loose wasn't a call that he was permitted to make. No. So instead he pleaded with Hajime to allow for a compromise. If they could sit tight and wait for the decision of the elders, then not only would they be free to roam the forest, but perhaps they could actually provide insight into where the entrance to the labyrinth was. This wasn't something Hajime really needed, but he figured getting their permission would be much less of a hassle than starting a mass genocide. So, in order to avoid making an enemy of an entire nation, Hajime obliged and decided to wait. It was about an hour later that a very old elf would arrive and ask Hajime a series of questions specifically about how he'd come to know about the Liberators. The reason why this is is because of a very peculiar law that had been passed down for generations. An ancient law stating how if someone appeared possessing the crest of the Labyrinth, then the Beastmen were not to oppose them no matter who they were. It was as soon as Hajime showed proof of this very thing that the Elder didn't hesitate to grant him whatever he needed. 
Of course, the beast men weren't too happy considering Hajime was a human, but according to the Elder, this was his right. The ancient law from the first Elder had made it that way. Not many of the other Elders knew this, but the elves and their lengthy lifespans were well aware of who exactly this law had come from. And because it was one that originated from a liberator themselves, this elven elder had no reason to oppose it. That being the case, Hashime's first request was to go to the Grand Tree immediately. His primary goal was to clear the labyrinth, then head to the next. Unfortunately for him, that wouldn't be possible for the next 10 days. The fog was far too thick for even the beastmen to traverse. If Hashime wanted to go to the tree, then he'd have to wait 10 days for the fog to reach its thinner cycle. Only then would any beast man be able to guide him there. So, with nowhere else to go, Hashime would be taken to the hidden city of Verbergen, a massive wooded landscape reminiscent of the one from Mushoku Tensei. Their initial entrance wasn't very eventful, but it was as they were settling in that the other elders came to protest. Not only did they not understand why Hajime was allowed to be here, but they also didn't like how the rabbit men were still alive either. Since they'd previously declared them traitors, their punishment of execution should have already been given. Before anyone could focus on that though, their biggest concern was the humans sitting among them. Yes, these elders were somewhat aware of the ancient tradition giving him the right, but many refused to believe that he was qualified. That being the case, the elder of the bearmen charged forward to test him. A surprise attack that was met with about as classic of a Hajime response as you could expect. It was without so much as a flinch that Hajime would catch the bear man's punch, proceed to break his arm, then use steel arm to send one back. This skill combined with the firing of a backwards shotgun embedded into his arm allowed for a punch that had significantly more force than a normal one. Since the shotgun was aiming backwards, not only would the recoil help to empower his punches, but the fired shell would also hit any enemies behind him. It's a pretty interesting application of his mechanical arm that we don't get to see in the anime. Now, this may have been a bit excessive, but the intended message was made loud and clear. No one in the room had any doubt that Hajime possessed the strength to clear the labyrinths now. That's not to say that everyone would treat him as an ally, but the elders would certainly make an effort to make sure no one would bother him again. So, with that particular issue taken care of, the next was the one regarding the Halia. For some reason, the beastmen still believed they could get away with executing them. Because they were the only ones who could lead Hajime to the tree, they felt they could use that as leverage to get what they wanted. What they failed to consider though was that the Halia could still lead him if they were alive. You see, just because their laws dictated that they needed to die, didn't mean Hajime had to abide by it. To him, this was a matter that he couldn't care less about. If the beastmen did insist on trying to execute them though, then Hajime would treat them as he would any other enemy. He was more than willing to wage war against every beastman in the entire city. That's just how committed he was to not breaking his promise. So, despite Hajime being this person who'd do anything to survive, outside of that he did still have his own principles. For any situation not involving his own personal survival, Hajime would actually strive to be a bit more honorable. If he didn't, then that would make him no different from the monsters. It was his way of showing that he still had some humanity left. Now, threatening mass genocide may not seem very humane, but that was just the way things turned out given the circumstances. I'm sure he had every intention of carrying it out had they opposed him, but luckily it forced the beastmen to come up with a different solution. It was a bit unprecedented, but by giving the Halia the title of Hajime's slaves, then by Verbergen law they would be considered dead, thus fulfilling the conditions of their punishment. The only caveat was that both Hajime and the rabbit men would have to be exiled. Because many of the elders weren't satisfied with this makeshift solution, the only way to appease them was to ensure they could never return. They didn't like having people who shared traits with monsters walking amongst them. So, if Shia and the others were to go free, then they were banned from entering Verbergen or any of their other cities. An insignificant price to pay for their freedom. Especially since neither Hajime nor the Halia cared to be there in the first place. But yeah. When all was said and done, the Halia were saved, Shia was now considered the cursed relative of Hajime, and Hajime had demonstrated he was more than just this edgy protagonist. It's a series of events that not only provide more depth to Shia's rather shallow character, but also highlights exactly who Hajime's become. Now, there is a whole bunch after this regarding the Halia's training and their subsequent war with the Bear Men, but that's not really that important. What is is Shia's development during her time in the Labyrinth her numerous displays of resilience that led Yue to finally accept her into the party. It's not something I think I'll talk about now, but I figured you should know that it's there, just in case you ever wanted to read it for yourself. But yeah, that's pretty much all that I got for today. 
If you like this type of cut content, then be sure to leave a like and comment so I know to do more. Now, as always, thank you so much for watching, and if you enjoyed this type of anime content, then you already know what to do. So, until next time, ciao!